I thought somebody should at least take advantage of the furniture. Um, sit down, take your coat off. I want to uh, express my gratitude for being invited to talk uh, here. I heard about Ted three or four years ago, and just was really excited when Ted came to San Antonio. I think it's a wonderful opportunity, and it's been a fascinating day. I'm going to speak today about remix in science. And I use the re word remix taking off from a book that Larry Lessig uh, wrote a couple of years ago. Lessig talked here at TEDx last year. And remix, as, as uh, Lessig is talking about, is taking video and audio and mashing them up. So you might take a Michael Jackson song and a Lady Gaga song and inter interplay them. Or for people of my generation, you would go to the theater late at night um, with uh, some illicit material, and you would watch The Wizard of Oz with Pink Floyd playing <laughs> behind it. <laughs> All right. And what I'm going to talk about is taking those ideas of mixing materials together as a means for communication within the sciences. Now, I'm a chemist by trade. I'm going to give you examples from chemistry. It's not important that you understand or even care about what the chemistry is. It's the fact that we're going to be able to communicate as scientists, and these ideas can really spread into all areas. So I want you to think about where science was, let's say, 100 years ago, and where science is today. So if you were a biologist 100 years ago and instantly got transported into the future, to today, and you were talking with a biologist, you'd have no frame of reference. Modern biology is linked to this molecule, the double helix of DNA. We talk about genes and inheritance and evolution in terms of this, and none of that was known 100 years ago. And if you were a physicist 100 years ago, I, well, you knew what an electron was, but you didn't know about, well, an alpha particle, and that was it. And nowadays, we're using huge machines. This is the Large Hadron Collider. It is the largest machine ever constructed by man to probe to the very tiniest pieces of matter and actually probing backwards into time to the earliest milli and microseconds of the universe. And again, a physicist from maybe even 50 years ago would be hard pressed to relate to what we're doing today. And an astronomer is peering into the vast reaches of the universe using the, the very large array, using radio telescopes. Well, radio was just barely around 150 years ago. Now, let's move to the library, to the way that scientists communicate. And this is how we communicate today. It is essentially unchanged from the way we communicated as scientists in the very first. So the very first scientific journal was the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, published around 1750 initially. And it was published onto a piece of paper and formatted very much like this. Now, I grant you, we don't very much read on paper anymore, but we're reading PDF files that are made up to look like paper. And so a scientist of 250 years ago would be able to understand how it is that scientists talk to each other. They would look at this, and, and the reference points make sense. There's a title. There's some authors. There's an abstract. That gives you a short summary of what this work is. Then there'd be an introduction that would set the context for what you are doing, why you're interested in this subject, what's been known beforehand, what you're trying to demonstrate in this work. And then you'd go on to the results in your discussion. You might have some figures, a whole lot of text. You have tables with numbers of data that you've collected. Some of that data might be presented in a, in a two-dimensional chart. Uh, you have other kinds of images, and you get to a conclusion where you summarize what it is that you have learned, what you want your audience to, to know. You'll have a section on how the experiments were conducted so that somebody could, in principle, go out and reproduce this experiment. And then there would be a section with citations indicate, you know, linking to other work that has been done in the past. And this format of scientific communication is unchanged for 250 years. Right? And if you think about the way we as individuals communicate, 
radically different than 250 years ago. But for scientists, for all the technology that we utilize in our research, we haven't made any changes whatsoever in how we talk to each other. So what I'm proposing that we do is, is to make a radical change and take advantage of this idea of remix, take advantage of being able to take bits and pieces from each other's work and combine them together. And I'll try to show you how that can be done and why that would be done. So this is sort of a representation of, a, of an article, but um, you know, that I've just walked you through and these lines indicate sort of the path that you would travel as you traverse the article. And the one concession to the 21st century that, that science communication has done is that now all of our stuff is up on the web and so you can use Google and Google Scholar and proprietary databases to find articles and you can go from the, from the references to get to those articles. So you don't need to physically walk to your library anymore, you can do this at your desktop and with your computer connected to the internet, you can get to the, the rest of the literature. Assuming, of course, that you've paid your subscription fees and your library has access to these things, but that's a whole different talk. Now, this is how I want to re-image the scientific article. It looks, in a sense, the same way. We have an introduction, an abstract, um, data, uh, conclusions, but these are now individual components, and these components are published independently. So your introduction would be a piece of text that sits on some place on the, in the cloud, separate from these other components. They're linked together so that you can move from one place to the other. But how you get from one place to the other is now much more open. And by having these components disassembled, it now allows for people to use them in different ways. More, most important is that we're going to change the way we're going to communicate our data. So data is the result of our experiments. It is what we're going to interpret and try to make discoveries from. And the way we publish today is perhaps the worst possible way. It, it in essence, is destroying information. So if you remember back to that two-dimensional plot with the straight line on there, that's what we would typically publish. Now, let's say you come along and you want to do an experiment in a related area and you want to see how your dot, your data point, falls on this plot. So you'd have to look at that data and try to guess where each of those dots that they've published, what the values are, and enter that into your spreadsheet and then see as your dots fall on that line. Well, where did that 2D plot come from? It came from an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Why not publish the Excel spreadsheet? Why not get that raw data into the hands of the entire community. And then the next scientist can come along with and get their hands on the actual data, put their own results in there, see if it matches up, or create some new model based off of the real data. So instead of destroying data in our publication scheme, we are disseminating the data so that all of us can make reuse of it. Now, this picture I have on the left is the way that we would typically represent, in this case, a particularly interesting molecule, but it would be a representation of any sort of three-dimensional data or, 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 or higher-dimensional data. So it might be um, uh, the, the structure of a protein. It could be uh, an MRI image, you know, three-dimensional MRI sliced from a body, um, anything that would be three-dimensional or higher. Now, in tradition, in traditional publishing, since we're going to be putting it on a piece of paper, we're compressing that 3D or higher data onto uh, two dimensions. Now, what if you want to look at the back side of that molecule? You want to see the other side of the lung from the MRI image. You can't take your piece of paper and turn it over. All right? What we should be doing is publishing that three-dimensional stuff. And Robert, can you put that up for me? 
All right, so this is that same molecule, but now instead of publishing a picture, I am going to distribute to you all the information to describe where everything is. And now you have the ability to pipe that information into your favorite visualization tool and manipulate it on your own. This is not an animation. Robert's actually back there moving his mouse and making things twirl on his own. All right. So the idea here is to get data in its native format into the hands of the community without any loss of information so that other scientists can work with, with the actual stuff and be able to do real work with it. All right, if we can pop back, please. All right, now the more, so, so I think very few scientists would have any um, issues with what I've been talking about so far. I think we all understand that we would like to get our hands in, on data. We don't do it because largely we're just in bad habits, okay? We, have, we collect the data, and then our process is to write up the paper and send it off to the journal, okay? We're not thinking about how do I get the data into somebody else's hands because until fairly recently that was impossible to do. But now with the internet, it's not impossible to do. It's very easy to do. All you got to do is take a data file. I don't care what your data is. It's a file. It's a collection of, of strings of zeros and ones, and you can upload it onto the internet, and somebody else can then go take it without any difficulty. All right. In the past, that wasn't easy to do. The next thing that I'm talking about is a little bit more out there. And this is really where the remix comes in. So I want to be able to get people to be able to use data and use other components and make reuse of this. So the bottom uh, portion is that same article, okay? And I've got that purple line there to kind of collect the article together. And now the next person comes around and is doing research in a related area. He's, he or she's going to build off of this original work. And when she's ready to write up her results, first thing she has to do is to write the introduction. Well, it's in an area that she's probably worked in before and lots of other people have worked in before. And scientists, like most other professional areas, frown upon plagiarism. So we try to write our introduction using our own words and we're trying to paraphrase, but Let's say this is an area that's been really well studied and there's, you know, 400 articles in there. And you're going to be the 401st person to come around and come up with an original way to summarize what's been done. We spend a lot of time wasting time doing something like this. So what I would propose is you grab the introduction from the previous paper and reuse that. And it's my contention that that's not plagiarism. It's coming from the data depository, it's going to be coming with the attribution of who wrote that originally, and that's all fine. We do that right now. If we're citing somebody, this citation comes along automatically. And so instead of having us to do things over and over, we can use pieces of each other's work and create our enhanced science, our new science, by really building off of people instead of having to rebuild things. What's necessary to get this done? Believe it or not, the problem is not technological. All the technology is there already. All we need to do is just find you know, somebody to, to house the data store. All right? And then there's some questions here whether it should be an institution or a society or a national government, but those are easy things to do. The more difficult thing is changing the culture of scientists, how we do the work and how we publish. And that's the hard part. What we need to do is establish some of the ground rules. We need to have open data, which means we're going to publish our data and allow complete reuse. I'm going to say, you can do whatever you want with it, and the person over here can do something else with it, and we can mine it and repackage and republish to our heart's content. It's all going to be attributed. The, att it, the attribution comes along automatically because you're pulling the data off of a common data store. So there's no plagiarism here. We also have to create what's called open standards. 
so that the data is packaged in a way that everybody can make use of it. You want to use your particular tool. I want to use my particular tool. We're going to grab the data from the same place and pipe it into our two tools. We need to ensure that that takes place. So we need to create standards so that it's reusable and lossless, and most importantly, has to be non-proprietary. We can't have to pay to be able to do this. We want to freely exchange our information. So what would this look like? We have a common data store that has, let's say, this protein structure. And somebody working on the left is looking at what the three-dimensional structure looks like. And somebody at the, who's working in the bottom area is trying to look at what are the proteins kind of match up in the shape. They might have similar activity. And the scientist up at the top is stripping down the structure and looking only at the, a, a very important part of the protein where the activity takes place and is trying to figure out what, what drug might come in there and block this. And a fourth person is grabbing the same data and adding it to the genome. So you're connecting the DNA with the product of the DNA, the protein. And everybody's grabbing the same piece of data but doing different things with it. And this can be done in, you know, outside of science. You might have some demographic data store in the middle, and you get city planners, and you get political scientists and school superintendents, all using that same piece of data, but for a different purpose. And this all works if we have open data and open standards, so that people can come in there and be guaranteed we're grabbing the, all the data and be able to reuse it for whatever purpose we need. So what's the point? We get data into the hands of everyone. That's what scientists really want to do. We want, we want the world to know what we've done. We want things to get built up on each other. And we have this great talk, you know, great standard of, you know, Stephen Hawking stood on the shoulders of giants. Well, Hawking didn't say that, Newton did. Newton stood on the shoulder of giants before him. We want to keep this, this rebuilding going on. We want to enhance collaboration. People from around the world can come in, grab the data, collaborate, develop new science. We want to reduce the reinvention of the wheel. We want people to be working on new stuff. We want to facilitate in innovation. And obviously, the end result is we're just going to ease the way that we communicate with each other. Amazingly enough, the challenges here are sociological. And it's a battle that I've been fighting for for five, no, but 10 years now. And I'm not sure when the battle's going to be won. But I think the case is compelling. And sooner or later, this sort of world is the way we're going to be doing science. Thank you very much. <laughs>